behind every good man is a good woman. In the case of Les, his special someone was at his side for more than 60 years. If Les was there, so was Lila. She was a loving wife, his best friend, and his biggest fan. Ron Mizutani has more on the inseparable Kiters. Les Kiter was one of Hawaii's finest storytellers. He was masterful at painting pictures and a wizard with words. So it's no wonder Kiter's own life story was almost a fairy tale. Ron, when he proposed to me on this dirt road in Yelm, Washington, 60 years ago, he said to me, I can't promise you much, but one thing I'll promise you, it will never be dull. And I will tell you that my life with him for 60 years with two sets of twins and a single birth and all the moving we've done in, in his success, it has never been dull. Lesson Lila's journey actually started in Hawaii. We were here in 1949. We came here, I was on my honeymoon. I thought it was terrific. Four months later, Les accepted a radio job here. But the lights finally came on and the game was played. And his folks, his father thought he was crazy. His father never, you know, who in those days would make a living? You know, there was no television, it was just radio. But who was going to make a living out of uh, broadcasting? Lila believed and soon found herself moving to San Francisco and then New York with a young family in tow. We landed in New York with three children in February. Barbie and Marty were a year and a half old and Ricky was three and a half and I've, I say to you, if anybody had given me an airline ticket, I would have gone right back to San Francisco. There we are in this huge city, no place to live. We couldn't find a, it was very hard in the 50s to find a place to live, but you persevere. The Kiters fell in love with the Big Apple and New Yorkers fell in love with Les, but the adventure was not over in 1970 they return to Hawaii. I will tell you that scene at the airport, I will never forget as long as I live with my fi our five children who by now are teenagers and young adults, 19 and 17 and 12, uh, with all their friends around them. And you know, that, that ages, they thought they were going to the end of the world. Barbara, Cindy and Jody adjusted. But for Ricky and Marty, if this wasn't the end of the world, it was pretty close. The two boys, every day they stood at the base of Diamond Head and watched the planes go by and wished they were on a plane. But Hawaii eventually became home and the family grew. Les would often say he couldn't have done it without his Lila, and she knew it. In all due modesty, I once said to his mother, who doted on him, spoiled him, rotten, uh, God rest her soul. But she once said that, uh, you know, the way I was, I said, you know, Dolly, if he had married somebody who wasn't able to step in and take over with the family, his children and everything, he would never have survived. They complimented each other, growing even closer in their golden years. He would never, ever uh, go go to bed mad. He, if there was any disagreement about anything, it, nobody ever went to bed uh, mad. Um, he just took everything in, in, in stride. Life takes very funny bounces. And uh, as Les said, you always have to roll with the punches. And he did a very good job of that. And I think he taught me to roll with the punches especially during unexpected moments. Lila recalls a luncheon the general once attended with military dignitaries. He was talking to a couple generals and this fellow came up to, uh, an aide and he said, General, we need you over here. And Les Cernan said, okay. And, and <laughs> the real general said, I'll take this one, Les. <laughs> For more than 60 years, they laughed and cried together. When it was time to say goodbye, they were together. I said, I'm gonna to bring him home. And I think he was very happy to come home. 
But he, he went very quickly after that, but he died very peacefully. A peaceful ending to a storybook career and a fairy tale marriage. He had a very full life. He almost reached 90. He never suffered. And uh, I think he would rest in peace. I really do. We'll all miss him. And uh, so long for now. Les Kiter was the consummate sports broadcaster, a man who approached every game, event, and introduction with the utmost professionalism. And of course, there was that voice. Those who knew him were not only mesmerized by his incredible talent, but his genuine love and respect for the people around him. John Venere spoke with some of those who knew Les Kiter as a colleague and a friend. The general's passion for his craft gained the respect of his peers. There aren't many broadcasters around the nation that haven't at least heard of Les Kiter. And in this market, he wasn't just heard, he was adored. You would tilt your head toward the radio a little bit more because he, he was that good. But it's his vast body of work that he was so good at. And, and he always treated you as an equal. He always treated you as a human being, that we were all in this together. We all shared this same kind of passion for bringing the word of sports to the people. Uh, he, was, he was one of the greatest. Les Kinder, everything he did, he did well. I did two years of Islander baseball with him, and I could write a book just about that. Les had one of those voices no matter what. Last time I saw him last fall at the quarterback club, he was declining physically, but the minute his mouth opened, there was the general. It was at the weekly quarterback club meetings that even after retirement, the general continued to touch the masses. Kiter served as a Toastmaster, where his true appreciation for the accomplishments of Hawaii's athletes and sports figures was on display. There's only one word that I can adequately describe Dave Shoji. He is our champion, Dave. Thank you, Les. You didn't even have any notes here. I can't remember who you beat last week. <laughs> you know, coming to the quarterback club meant uh, uh, Les Kiter. You'd, you'd get to hear his booming voice, and uh, if you're fortunate, he'd introduce you. And, and anyone who's been introduced by Les Kiter, I know you know this, he'll, he'll make you feel really good because he'll, he'll pump you up a couple levels of, uh, higher than what you actually are. And I just want to say to Al, to John, and to Dwight, and to Bob, Nobody speaks of you individually without saying members of the Fab Five, and you will live on forever. If we ever ran short of time at a meeting, he always had a story. And I don't know how many stories I've heard, but he always, and he always has a new story. He knew how to introduce people. I couldn't make up the kind of things that he, he said. I kind of look forward to the people he introduced made such a difference to, I think, the whole United States. He started something up so original, and he gave us all an awful lot of fun when we were listening to. I, to me, it was just sheer pleasure. All the way up to his final days, the general's priority was to solidify Hawaii as an epicenter for sports in the West. We were working to try and uh, uh, promote Hawaii as a sports destination. And we were at a hearing at the legislature once, and he told the legislators, if you want to run with the big dogs, you can't pee like a puppy. <laughs> He's probably the only guy in Hawaii who could get by with that. You look at a guy like, like Les Kiter, I mean, wow, he lived among us for a long time. And it, it's, uh, you know, I didn't know him that well, but, you know, he well enough that he'd say, hey, hey, kid, <laughs> you know? Yeah, but, uh, you know, he, again, a legendary passing. And we're delighted to have him any time at the quarterback. Thanks, General, for the stories the memories, and most of all, your friendship. So long for now. Up next, the mentor and inspiration to a new generation of sports broadcasters. The general left some big shoes to fill when he retired from Channel 2. Stories from those who followed in his footsteps.